So we begin with opening the main stage, session one. This session is all about the intersection of culture and black music, sounds of social justice, the responsibility of the music industry to impact change, all right? And today's, this uh, panel will actually be moderated by my good friend and uh, of course, music industry royalty, Azeem Rashad. Uh, senior Vice President and Head of Urban Promotion at Columbia Records. Y'all give him a round of applause and all the love. It's gonna be a good one. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? What's happening on to our Amazon and our live stream? Um, pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be here actually and um, excuse my back. This is a, gotta calm down a little bit. This has been a great thing. Anybody been to the museum other than me last night? This is this is legacy work, as my good friend Lynn Scott says. Uh, shout out to Henry, shout out to Tawisha, shout out to Deanna Williams, who's the godmother of Black Music Month. And if, you, if you're watching this, get to Nashville, take a day trip, come here, see the museum. This is truly history in the making, a living work for all of us. So I'm just glad to be here. So let's get started. I'm sorry to be so late, but you know, we're gonna get this done. Our first guest today. Hello, hello. There we go. Our first panelist today is a Grammy nominated artist, activist, teacher, and called by common and black thought from the roots a quadruple threat and a groundbreaker. She's the owner of her own label, MKY Entertainment. And she has a new album dropping today, which you all should go cop on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, wherever you get your music. It's called Queen of Culture. Please welcome Ms. Mumu Fresh. <laughs> Our next guest is a, kind of a friend of mine. We met through a good friend. He's a political expert, a pop culture enthusiast, a change agent, He's an industrial engineer by trade. Mike has turned himself into a media icon. He can be heard on Sirius XM, his own show, as well as Way in the Morning and seen on Good Morning America. Please welcome my good friend, Mike Muse. <laughs> welcome, Mike. Thank you. Last but definitely not least, our next panelist needs no introduction. He truly is the definition of a multi-hyphenate. Minister, educator, author, orator. I would call him a public speaker, but he's really an orator. Political, social, and cultural analyst. He's the voice of our collective consciousness, an expert on race, hip hop, sports, and music. Please welcome my hero, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. So we're gonna jump right into it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is Black Music Month, and the panel is Sounds of Social Justice, the Responsibility of the Music Industry to Impact Change. And I wanna throw our first question to Mumu Fresh, um, because she is, she is an artist, and I wanna make sure that, that artist advocacy is something, I'm a former artist as well, so artist advocacy is something that's close to my heart. Um, Mumu, as exemplified here in the museum, Black artists have fought throughout the decades to have their voices and their stories told and celebrated. What motivates you to keep doing the work you've been doing towards progress? What motivates me is that there is a concerted effort to prevent us from doing it. So I wanna know why. So the more I find blockages and obstacles to telling our own story, to connecting the dots of our lineage and how our music is spiritual food for us. It makes me wonder, who are we? That such an effort will be put in place to stop not just us as a people, but in particular, to co-opt our music. What's inside of our sound? Why is our music the voice of revolution all over the whole planet? And um, when I ask myself those questions, and I say, well, that must be where the secret is, it must be there. It's not in the things that they're allowing us to do, but in the things that, you know, there, there's an effort to prevent. So I learned to sing 
from my mother and my grandmother in my grandmother's house, cooking greens and cleaning up the house, sweeping. And she would tell me old stories about Mississippi and how we came to be. And people would call my grandmother and ask her to lay hands on them. And she would sing over their bodies to pull pain mm. out of their bodies. Amen. That's long, you know, before I ever knew there was a music industry, that's what I understood sound to be about, you know. And it's still true now. And I, because I know, you know, my grandmother said, if you knew better, you do better, right? Because I know, I have a responsibility to carry that lineage on, that spirit on, that's in that, that sound, that frequency, those frequency waves that can shift matter, then I have a responsibility to, to do it. So I put everything, I own everything I love on the line to carry that on. As a follow-up to that, and, and because we're talking about what you're doing and the power of intention basically is what you're talking about, right? Um, a lot of us in the industry, it's about celebrity. And being an independent artist, obviously, is hard, it's difficult, but you do have an audience. Do you find that you sacrificed anything in going the independent route? to have your voice heard versus being in a bigger system? Yeah, you always do. But I knew that going into it. I was told over and over again, you, <laughs> you'll never amount to anything if you do it this way. <laughs> so, so I definitely knew going into it that it would be the road less traveled, it would be the harder road. But I know that I can't take the other path. My ancestors do not play about me doing what I didn't come here to do. I have to do what I came here to do, you know? Mm -hmm. They will wreck my world. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not even joking about that. So um, yes, it's the harder path. Yes, it takes longer. Yes, it's more expensive. Yes, there are more closed doors. Um, but when people come to my show or they reach out to me and they tell me the impact that my music has had in their lives, that has sent them in a different trajectory, that it has healed, it is, you know, people have told me they use my, my music in cancer treatment, in holistic tra cancer treatment therapies. That's enough for me. I already I did my job, you know, that's enough for me that I, um, that I stayed the course and it allowed my sound to be unadulterated, mm -hmm. you know, because otherwise they'd have mixed all the healing frequencies out of the, out of the sound, you know, they'd have compressed it and gated it and put some other wild stuff on it that um, disconnects it from the spirit that it was born in, the, the experience that created that sound, um, they would have disconnected it, me from it. So I would, I would take, I don't mind taking it on the chin, and I'm not saying that it's, it's very, very difficult. One of my students, she asked me, she said, I'm debating if I should be a singer or if I should be a doctor. I said, if you have to ask, you should go be a doctor. Right. Because this is going to be the hardest thing you've ever wanted to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, keep doing the work, and congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Mike, we'll throw it to you because of your media expertise. According to a study on music field work, 35% of black people say the average American is not knowledgeable about the influence of African-American culture on modern music. Do you personally see the narrative shifting? It's a really great question. One, thank you uh, for having me here. Uh, two, I'll be remiss if I didn't say these are the most comfortable panelist chairs I've ever <laughs> sat on in my entire life. I don't have a chair, uh, I wouldn't so know. Cheers to museum for that. Uh, that question is a great question. The narrative is shifting. We have data that suggests that, and then there's anecdotal data. The data comes from, we all know that hip hop is the most streamed uh, and consumed music of all time. We all know hip hop was birthed out of the story of our culture, the story of our people. Hip hop tells the story, the narrative of the struggle, the strife, the pain, but also to the joy and the happiness. It is the storytelling of our people. It's the storytelling of our culture. So the data does suggest that. The challenge, though, is how much we have allowed society to take black music away from us. We have even believed that black music is only relegated to R&B and hip hop. We have so long forgotten the ways that country music, now that we're in Nashville, is black music. 
Country yeah. music was birthed from black music. Country music was birthed from the Delta, the Mississippi, as it traveled with the great migration north to the Midwest, to Chicago, through jazz, to the West in California, where Lynn Scott is based at. But really, it goes back even further to the banjo. The banjo comes from the sub-Sahara parts of Africa, and that's where it really comes from. So now the idea that we look at a black country music artist like Jimmy Allen, Lola, and think they're the outlier, shame on us. Shame on us for making them feel like they're an outlier in their own music. Right. Yeah. That they originated. Shame on us when we clown Willow Smith for wanting to do rock and roll. Shame on us for forgetting that we created rock and roll. Shame on us for allowing them to take their narrative from us and we bought into it. So as we look externally, we unfortunately have to do the uncomfortable work of looking internally at ourselves. And so we have to say, I need to intentionally go out and support Jimmy Allen. I need to intentionally go out and support Lola. I need to intentionally talk about country music. I need to intentionally get back to our roots. And so, yes. Black music is the most consumed, we have the data, and literally the narrative has been taken away from us. Um, and I believe too, we as media, we as industry, executives and singers, have to be mindful of how we allow white artists to use us for a feature. Okay. <laughs> and I think I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> well, well, listen, we're gonna come back to that. Yeah. Um, but thank you. Dr. Dyson, in this museum, there's a through line of social justice and black music within the galleries. Let's start the conversation with you by discussing the importance of social justice within black music. And a follow up is what are defining moments and songs in history that stand out to you? Well, first of all, great to be here with you and on this extraordinary panel. I mean, listening to uh, Moo Moo Fresh if y'all ever heard her sing or spit, she can do, she can, she, she, she can do it both now. And with, uh, with incredible, incredible talent. So it's always an honor to see her perform, whether on stage, singing, talking, spitting, or just radiating wisdom. And, and Brother Mike, my man from, from Michigan, Flint, before the water was bad. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it was discovered to be. That's a different story. But his brilliance and his genealogical explanation about the racial artifice that split off uh, agrarian music that was black into the blues that was white into country music. So the irony is when Hank Williams Jr. hates Negroes, he's hating himself. Well. Um, <laughs> Don't let that go over your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all right, Doc. So uh, when you talk about social justice, you know, black music has been tethered to social justice from the beginning because that's what we're about. The sound that we made, you know, on when we were forced to perform, before we got to the new world in Africa, when travel logs of European scholars <clears throat> or thinkers going through Africa, they were demonizing while they were admiring us. And that set the paradigm. Hating on us, but then being attracted to us at the same time. And they admired the, the sensual confidence mm. in the embodiment that black people radiated just by being free. Mm -hmm. And so they mad at the kind of liberty and emancipation we radiate through our sound, through our dance, through our bodies. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, you know, I think about 1792, Isaac Cruikshank painting of a black girl hanging from one leg on a pulley rope where she's about to be flogged and soon after to die from a white enslaver because she refused to get up and dance. Because they danced the captives on the slave ship to keep them in shape, to entertain the mostly white 
uh, men on board, but also for sexual titillation. And when I hear Mumu Fresh talk about, you know, chastening and meeting out that healing sound, that redemptive vibration, that sister on that ship said, you ain't gonna make me captive to your white supremacist ideology. So black performance since then has been trying to recover an African identity in which we were rooted that allowed us to be as free sensually, sexually, emotionally, and spiritually, and at the same time, fight the vicious combat, to combat the vicious stereotypes about who we are in America. So social justice has been on the agenda from the get-go, mm -hmm. right? The slave hollers, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm dealing with the sinus, the slave hollers, when you think about the fact that we were entertaining massa but emancipating the masses, right? Green trees abandoned, ain't got long to stay here. That mean Harry Tubman coming through in the spring, get your stuff together. She would sing them songs to let them know it's good time or bad time. Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray, right? They singing songs, masses think they sound good, we trying to signify to each other quilts we're making with arrows on them. Turn left at the Johnson Plantation and haul your black behind out of here. So we were giving signals in the music and in the quilt and in the culture and in the dance. That's why they outlawed the drum. James Brown could not have had a job back in the slave quarter, right? Because they outlawed the ability to percussively communicate the transcendent tribe. Right, we ain't came here speaking the same languages out of the different ethnicities of an African continent, but we learn to communicate with each other through rhythm, right? And now we see it come full circle. Um, so when I think about some of the social, and what I mean by full circle, we got, we, you know, I'm from a generation, you can tell, I'm a little bit older, ha, huh? uh, that we didn't know what mumble rap was. Right, we, we, we had clearly articulated words standing by the speaker. Suddenly I had a fever. Was it me or either summer madness? Because I just can't stand around. So I get closer and the closer I get, the better it sounds. Now we got, you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, no, not really. I, 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 I didn't get that, right? I've been black all my life, but maybe the deliberate distortion and obscuring of the sound, first of all, it's the absorption. The sonic absorbs the rational and rearticulates it as melody. So when you hear little baby or da baby, or little irk, or little z, or, or little low, or big low, or baby mama, whatever, right? The brilliance of what they have done is to absorb the melodic line, the harmonic intensity of the music making that the precedent because that communicates with the soul and spirit in a way even beyond the lyrical integrity of a particular art form. Not to dismiss it, right? Not to dismiss it, yes, sir. but to understand what it is. So, what, so maybe the reason they saying it in a way you can't understand it because when they were clear, you were still killing them on the street corner. You're still shooting them. You're still disrespecting them. So now they create a music that old people ain't supposed to understand and people outside their communities can't understand. Think about it. From the very beginning, I'll end by saying this, uh, not only on the, uh, before the slave ship, on the slave ship, on the plantation, uh, beyond the plantation, when we were out here uh, trying to articulate our beliefs, uh, you think about you know, uh, blues and jazz, you think about Louis Armstrong, why it makes me so black and blue, when you talk about uh, what happened in the 1940s and 50s with Billie Holiday, y'all saw she got arrested, the FBI harassing her, uh, the music, right? The, the, the strange fruit. Uh, make it real compared to what? 1969, Marvin Gaye, 1971. Rockets, moonshot, spend it on the have not. Make me wanna holler, throw up both my hand, right? An entire musical genre. A, 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 a theme album in 1971 that his own musical boss, who was black, didn't want him to release. He said, you're a sex symbol, you're a star. Why are you gonna deal with social consciousness? But he had been, you know, his brother had been to Vietnam. Tammy Terrell had been, you know, had died. He was depressed. 
He was looking around. He's looking at the ecology. Mercy, mercy me, things ain't what they used to be. One of the first songs in America to deal with the ecological structure of American society and the devastation that would be rendered, the taxes he couldn't pay, the Vietnam War, the police brutality. He talked about it. Uh, the whole thing in that album that was linked together and then ending with God is love, right, at its high point. So that's the kind of musical tradition leading into hip hop, leading into a Moo Moo Fresh that if you listen to her, mediating African consciousness through an art form that is postmodern blackness, joining together the rhythm, the melody, the harmony, and the drum. So when, when I think about those moments in our culture, you know, whether it's a Jay-Z, Bin Laden, Bin happening in Manhattan back then, back when the police was Al-Qaeda to black men, or Tupac said just the other day, I got lynched by some crooked cops, and to this day, them same cops on the beat getting major pay. But when I get my check, they taking tax out, so we paying the cops to knock the blacks out. Or Lauren Hill said, even after all my logic and my theory, I added MF, so you ignorant people hear me. So there are so many moments. The entire catalog of this woman down here is an instance of the vibrant connection of the spiritual ingenuity of the folk with the high intelligence of the masses mediated through sound. So those are a few things that I think uh, pop up today. Thank you. OK, it's over. Uh, good night, everybody. Now. Thank you, Dr. Dyson. Um, seriously, though, to piggyback that question, and, and Mike will throw it back to you on the media front. One, we all know that black music, American music is black music, if you think about that. Every genre, and we get genres confused with formats, but every genre of music is black music because we've done that, to your point, from the slave ship on and, and up to now. I often have said that hip hop is America's number one export, historically, period, point blank. It knows no color, it knows no race, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, who you love, why you love. If you can hear that drum, you can hear that beat, no matter where you are, no matter what you speak, you are a hip hop head. <laughs> to that point, Mike, do you feel like we should be taking more of a serious and kind of a fight the power attitude about it? Or, or can this, in these times right now, can the space of entertainment for entertainment's sake versus the message that we need to articulate to our young people and even some of our older people, can they coexist or should we lean more to the left or lean to the right? Yeah, uh, so let me just clarify, make sure we we may answer to, should like hip hop moderate social discourse? Yes. Or? Okay. Thank you for articulating the question, but <laughs> you're in media, I'm not. No, 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 no. It, it was a great question. I could have went so many places with it. Yes. So I wanted to give you due justice. Yes. But I think just by the very nature of hip hop is a rebellious act unto itself. And I think because being black is a rebellious act unto itself here in our society. I was talking with Trey The Truth recently as he got honored uh, for his Billboard Award uh, for community impact and for community service. And it made me think about this narrative of who is qualified to be in social justice, who is qualified to lead movements, who is qualified to speak. I've always been under the notion that we have to remove that idea of qualification. We have to remove the idea that you have to be degreed, you have to talk a certain way, you have to use subject <laughs> verb agreements to get rid of all that because of all the pain it has done us. Uh. I'm a witness to this. Uh. I have always never seen myself as an activist. It wasn't really until recently. The activist community and the black community made me feel like I wasn't uh, because I wasn't fist in the air, uh, because I didn't march with the bullhorn, um, because I didn't do all the marches all down the streets and the rallies, they made me feel as like an outsider. Until one of my friends said, your work is different, but it's no less activism. You often do it through economic activism and economic change, through donations and fundraising and all type of things. It just looks different. Then coupled with, I had a white man 
on air, and I won't say, I won't give this person any uh, credit or amplify, but the lesson was, he said that he has done more for the black community than I have because he played in black film. Wow. And played in black parts. Shame on us for allowing him to do that. That's, that's number one. But then there were a couple of black people who were around, listen to this, who tried to qualify me and said, no, what you don't know about Mike is he went to the University of Michigan. He has an engineering degree. He's worked with all the presidents. I stopped them. I said, don't you do that. And I turned to the camera and I talked to black people. And I said, never let anyone think that your blackness is not enough. Amen. Never let anyone think that you are never qualified to be black in your own blackness. The very existence that you were born black is your birthright to be black. Mm. And it's qualified you enough to talk about blackness. Mm. And when I tell you the DMs I got, the tweets I got from people crying, saying they had never felt that seen. There was one lady said she stood up in her cubicle crying and clapping, listening to the radio because other black people had made her feel unworthy because she didn't have the degrees. Mm. I had grown men saying they pulled over on the side of the road in tears because of how they realized society has made them feel about their blackness and not being worthy and not being whole. I have this other man DM me recently, was in prison. He got out and now he's leading this incredible movement in the state of California where he actually now goes before the state legislators and advocates for performative justice. And he said it's because of listening to me talk about not needing to be qualified. And so that is hip hop. That is all what Mooma Fresh and her colleagues represent is the idea of messaging and communication. And that, for me, is a form of activism. That is why I love, I did TED Talks about this, uh, because 12-year-old Abby is in the room, I would say my favorite song is At the Police by N.W.A. <laughs> that really signified what was happening in the streets with police brutality. Unfortunately, it's still happening today. Right. But they were also, too, going against this political system with Nancy Reagan and just say no and the censorship movement that was happening. And so for the fact of, like, hip-hop was birthed out of our culture, the near fact of being black is activism and enough. Uh, hip-hop, by a birthright, is activism and is social justice, whether or not is intentionally said in the lyrics or unintentionally said. The being of itself is activism because it was our communication of our hardships and our struggles. Love that. Thank you, Mike. Listen, last year, give it up for him. Um, last year, George Floyd's death, obviously, uh, his killing, obviously sparked a movement in the music industry. Uh, the show must be paused. Shout out to the two young ladies who started that. Um, quite simply, Dr. Dyson, does the music industry have a responsibility to adjust? Social justice, executives, artists, people in the game. Yes, sir. And we have that responsibility as citizens, as human beings, no matter what your job is. And as Brother Mike brilliantly just deconstructed, no matter where you is, bloom where you planted, no matter where you are, right? And you can do what you got to do. And sometimes it's better bad boys move in silence. Well, OK, like right? Lasagna. Right? Like lasagna, right. Like, let's hit the little Wayne. <laughs> Man, a milli, a milli, okay. So the thing is, is that, is that right? Um, that you got to, you know, you got to bloom where you planted. You got to do it where you do it. Everybody don't do it the same way. And we are so harshly judgmental of each other, right? I got to say this. I don't know if y'all saw the Shimamanda, you know, controversy over the trans young student who was her, you know, Shimamanda, the great uh, novelist, and her trans student. There's a big thing, and she released a scorching, scorching um, uh, 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 post called It Is Obscene. I would recommend that you read it. The whole deal is, is that the cancel culture has undermined our capacity to make mistakes, to admit we made a mistake, and then move forward. Now, I don't mean pe people doing crazy stuff who need to get out of here. 
I don't, I don't mean that. I ain't talking about no white supremacists. I ain't talking about cancel culture the way Donald Trump talk about it. Right. Well, the thing is that it's cancel culture. No, I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about, so I'm, you know, white supremacists who try to protect themselves against being held to account. Read Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, where the, the emotional intensity of whiteness puts forth its hurt feelings to deflect you from coming at it because you make me uncomfortable and I need to be comfortable and you black people are making me uncomfortable. Good, because discomfort is the predicate for knowledge and education. If you ain't uncomfortable in the classroom, I ain't just there when black students come, I ain't just there to reinforce your comfort. I'm trying to make you uncomfortable in your bourgeois Negro identity. I'm trying to challenge you thinking you rah-rah, given what Brother Mike said. That ain't the only way to do it, right? Some people doing it behind the scenes. Sammy Davis Jr. was giving dope. Now, he was with Richard Nixon. It was problematic. You need to call him out. But he also gave more money than any other entertainer to the civil rights movement. It's a complicated thing. Now, that don't mean you don't hold people accountable. And I ain't by saying this. I want to take the flip side of what Brother Mike was saying, too. Well, you go to PhD from Princeton. Nigga, I wasn't born there. I was born on the west Talk. side of Detroit, right? So I'm saying that the, that the flip side of it is don't assume because I got a degree and I'm a professor that I think I'm better than you because I don't. Because if, if the little girl wasn't here, I would break it down <laughs> on the obscene tip. <laughs> you know, F the police coming straight from the underground. A young brother got it bad because I'm brown and not the other color. So police think they have the authority to kill a minority. But I would break it down even more on the obscenity tip. The point is that don't assume just because I am where I am and do what I do that you think that I'm some handkerchief head sellout Negro. Some people oh. assume that. Now they hear me talk to them. But the thing is, you assume. And part of it is ignorance in the social media. You've been born five days, but you know the world. You the expert, you know everything. You disrespect your elders, your dog people who are older than you because they ain't as radical as you. Do you know some of those gray haired sisters that paid the price for you to be your self-involved, self-caring self? <laughs> and self-regard is critical. I ain't mad at self-regard, self-critical. You know, I'm, I'm self-critical about that. Maybe if Martin Luther King Jr. had had some self-care when they did an autopsy on his body at 39, they would have shown that he had the heart of a 60-year-old man. The pressure was real. But at the same time, on the flip side of it, it ain't everything about how it makes you feel. Some stuff gonna make you feel uncomfortable, and that's a good thing. Yes, and so I think that the cancel culture impulse that you go on social media and cancel everybody you don't like is life is bigger than that, baby. It's bigger than Twitter. It's bigger than Facebook. It's bigger than Instagram. It's bigger than swiping left or right. There's something deep in the soil where people mess up and then fess up and then dress up. I did what I did. I messed up to allow me to be forgiven into a new self because I don't know who these perfect people are. Saying stuff and it's so righteous, cisgender. You didn't know what cisgender meant five years ago. Stop. <laughs> you ain't even known what that meant. Now, I'm glad you know now. Right. You know, talking about critical race theory. First of all, they don't even know what critical race theory is. They lying because they don't even know what it means, right? That's a new term for people. And a lot of Negroes wasn't celebrating Juneteenth. They didn't even know about it. Right. right. Let's just be real. Yes. So all of this self-righteousness and Negro ideology where I am better than you, save that. Get down here on the ground, it was West Montgomery said, with the rest of us and struggle. Make mistakes, hold each other accountable, love each other into better human beings, and then learn, even as a young person, you might have a microphone, but you always shouldn't speak. Let people who have been deeply invested, I mean, speak until you know, speak until you feel it. Because the, the problem with social media is when you make a mistake, it lives with you forever. Yes. And now you got to, you know, t 10 years later, did you not tweet this? Yeah, but I was young and stupid and said some stuff. Imagine if Twitter was around. I'm 62 years old. Boy, my Jesus, God. <laughs> some of the stuff I said and thought and believed about myself, about other people, about women. The, the, the hip-hop ain't the first people to call a woman to be at. Stop. Stop it. Because, and, and use the N-word. The pastor of my church said, I preach to these people today, <laughs> right? And I'm 62. That ain't started with Snoop Dogg. So my point is that, yes, we are responsible to raise consciousness as artists, to speak to the truths of the reality that we confront, but at the same time, to be a model and an emblem and a symbol of the transformative possibility of real black art 
dipped into the healing waters and the redemptive currents of our consciousness so that we can bring a ministry of salvation in whatever way you see that to the masses of black people who listen to us and who follow us. Thank you. Give it up for Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. He has to run. But we, you are a national treasure. We love you, brother. We hope to have you back. Love y'all so much. Uh, as we move on, and we will be wrap soon, um, Mumu, oh, thank you, Lynn, I appreciate that. But I think Tuisha and everybody else has a different agenda today. Um, Mumu, we'll bring it to you. Um, are there any current causes or organizations that you're supporting that you want to amplify that people should know about, specifically in your home region or even na nationally? Yes, a lot. Um, a group I grew up in that my auntie and my mother started it's called uh, Womb Work Productions, and it is musical street theater from the time I was maybe 12, and they're still operating now. We would post up on street corners and do um, create these theatrical plays about the impact of heroin in our community, the impact of crack. You know, growing up in Baltimore, I don't know a family that was not devastated by, you know, drug use yeah. and, and the sale of drugs. Um, and we would become the drug and you know, personified and get the whole community involved to really show them the impact of it. Um, we did a lot of work on domestic violence and dating violence, uh, understanding um, ourselves more, doing more personal development so we can figure out what things inside of us attract toxic relationships. So their organization that's a nonprofit that's still pulling in youth from the community and teaching them about self-love and about you know African culture. And um, they, they, they're on a trip right now into Tanzania taking young wow. people from Baltimore. Um, That's awesome. The Indigenous Peoples Movement, started by Yonajaha Lone Wolf. She's black in um, Ogallala, Lakota. They do amazing work in both indigenous and black communities having to do with environmental justice. Um, until freedom, you know, I love Tamika. Of course, of course. Shout out to <laughs> Tamika Mallory. Tamika and my son, I always am in support uh, of everything that they're doing. So, um, yeah, those are some of the organizations I love. That's awesome. Mike? Yes, so there are two things I would now highlight that I'm affiliated with. Um, one is I uh, founded this nonprofit organization called Vote Quadrant. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Lynn was literally the energy uh, behind it all to make sure that I went forward and did. I can't thank you enough for the support. Um, it is a strategic voting system to end police brutality. Um, it is strategic voting, and it's systematic voting, and it's single issue voting. Uh, if we care about ending police brutality, we have to think about that at the ballot box. Uh, we think too often that we have to vote for the president in order for a make change on community and policing to get them to stop killing black people. Um, we also focus on the senators and the governors, which is great, and we should, and definitely those federal things, but it actually starts at home locally uh, in the four municipal offices, which is the mayor um, who actually appoints a police chief. Um, and so you focus on the police chief, but you ask your mayoral candidates questions as if he or she is running for a police chief. And the questions that you ask them, it's in a guidebook that we created is, what would you do about community policing? Should the police officers be of the community, from the community? How would you reevaluate the training? How would you go about testing the officers? How would you go about firing bad cops? That's how you should talk to your mayor, mayoral candidates about running for the office if you care about police officers stop killing us. The third part of that quadrant is a district attorney. We far too often don't focus on the district attorney, um, but the district attorney is the one who actually brings the cases to trial against the police officers. And far too often, district attorneys are too in bed with police officers to want to bring forward a trial. And so we need to start asking and actually paying attention to the district attorney because they are the most pivotal individuals who can actually bring a case for the case and even go before the grand jury to actually get the indictment to bring forward. And then a caveat to that is they also too don't have to charge our young black and brown boys and girls. They can sentence them to maybe job training, GED training. They don't have to take them to court and recommend 20 years to life for stealing a snicker. The fourth thing is the features in the quadrant system is our judicial candidates, our judges. We never pay attention to that period, period. The judge, if you want to change criminal justice, and I know you have to wrap, if you want to change criminal justice, the judge is the gateway. 
Yes. The judge literally decides the sentencing and the fate of these individuals. We don't pay attention, and you don't ask judges questions. What the guidebook does, it assists you with asking what type of questions to ask judicial candidates about lived experiences. Because far too often, these judges sit across and sentence these black and brown boys and girls as if they are grown adults because they can't recognize their experience. But these same judges will look at these white boys and girls who are convicted of rape and say, but you really didn't mean it. You're going to Stanford. You're on the swim team. That actually happened. So I'm not going to sentence you. I don't want to mess up your life. Because he saw himself as that young swimmer, as that boy. So we have to get those involved. So that's votequadrant.com. Uh, we can love all your support, uh, financial contributions, donations. Once again, votequadrant.com. And to conclude, I created Law Ch I'm co-founder of Law Champs, a tech startup company in Silicon Valley, uh, where we focus on um, legal services and access for everyone, uh, no matter what city and state that you're in, in particular, intellectual property. I've also gone around and done talks around the country about intellectual property as social justice for black people. We give up our IP so easily on social media and on TikTok, and we never are able to monetize it because we never think our culture is value. We never think our isms are valuable until Vogue determines that it is, and then it becomes monetizable for them. We always see what we do as ghetto or uncouth until Wendy's thinks differently and tweets about it. And then they make money off of our isms, but we never trademarked it. It's a whole other panel, so brother. that is exactly what lawchamps.com does uh, for affordable services. And for the attorneys out there, we're offering a discount code for you to sign up to as well. So that's it. Love that, Mike. Can I add one more thing? To yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Because she is here today who runs Project Hygiene. She's the reason that I'm, I'm here. So I do want to shout out her organization. They provide... Uh, sanitary um, products for the homeless, and Iman, who's also part of uh, why I'm here, they also um, they do a lot of great work in Chicago. You should look them up, the Inner City Muslim Action Network. So I'll be remiss if I ain't shout them out too. Love it, thank you. Give it up for our panelists, Dr. Thank Michael you. Eric Dyson, Mumu Fresh, Mike Muse. Listen, we are live from the National Museum of African American Music. This is Black Music's home. It's Black Music Month. Today is our State of Black Music Summit. I have to give a shameless plug to Sony Music and all my contemporaries who are part of this museum and anybody who's contributed. Give a dollar. Give ten dollars. Come here. Write a check. See it. Buy a sweatshirt. Follow them on social media. But no one, and, and it says in every holy book you'll read, God does not change the condition of a people until they change the conditions themselves. We have power. We are empowered. This is our building. This is our history. Please support this museum with everything you can, whenever you can, how often you can. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you. Please enjoy the rest of the summit. God bless. Thank you.